You may think you hate it now, honey, but where do you drive it? Now that was a classic Whoa, beater. Welcome to Flynn Dog Woodwork. Have you ever purchased an item with high expectations only to let it collect dust in your shop? Well, that's what we're gonna take a look at today. I've got five items that are collecting dust on my shop and five items that might be better alternatives. So let's go take a look at them. So my intent of this video is not to rip on these tools, but instead show you some other tools that might be a better use of your money. In fact, none of the tools we're gonna be taking a look at today are cheap tools by any means. Most of these tools are high-end quality tools that may get a lot of use in someone's shop, but they just don't get a whole lot of use in mine. So let's get started and take a look at this first tool, which is also the most expensive tool. So early in my woodworking career, I watched a lot of YouTube videos just like you, and I fell into the Fest Tool rabbit hole. These are just some of the Fest Tools that I have in my shop. Now I totally get that Fest Tool may not be in everybody's budget. But if it is in your budget and you do have a Festool, I'm guessing you'll back me up in vouching for the quality and precision of all Festool products. But you definitely don't need Festool to get that quality and precision. In fact, I would say that I use Ryobi tools more often than I do my Festools. So what Festool product is it that's collecting dust in my shop? Well, let's go check it out. So here it is, the Festool MFT. Now what does MFT stand for? Well, it stands for Multifunctional Table. Now I'm not gonna go over all the features and functionality of the MFT as I have a whole video dedicated to this. However, I will tell you the features that I use the most. And I say features very loosely as there really is only one feature that I use this table for and that's to make accurate cross cuts. By placing your track down and putting your track saw on top, you can be assured that your cut is gonna be exactly 90 degrees. And that MFT does an excellent job of making those perfect 90 degree cuts. However, I purchased that MFT to do a heck of a lot more. Obviously, one of the features of this table is it does have bench dog holes. And since I was getting into hand tools, I thought this would be an excellent place to place my bench dogs and do some things like planing. There's also a nice track where you can clamp work pieces down and do some work on the edge of your workpiece. The problem is this workbench rests on two foldable legs. This means when you go to pick up your hand plane to plane down some wood, this table is going to move on you. Just look at this lateral movement. That by no means is secure enough to do any hand planing. So you could do some chisel work or some fine detail work with the MFT, but by no means can you do things like planing unless you take that surface, unattach it from the legs and securely mount it to something else. So since primarily the MFT in my shop is being used to make cross cuts, there's a better solution. Let's go check that out. So in my shop, I reach for two things, a rail square and a track. Now obviously you're gonna have some track that will accommodate your track square. The key part of this is getting a rail square. Now the first rail square that I ever purchased was this Insta Rail Square XL, and this thing was expensive. Since then, I've purchased some of these cheaper rail squares, and these seem to do just as good a job. And the price difference between these two rail squares is really quite unbelievable. This Insta Rail Square XL is $180. You're kidding me, God! This cheaper one is less than $35. And the key point here is you get the same results with the MFT as you do with a track as well as a rail square. So save yourself some money and don't let an MFT table collect dust and space in your shop. Well, that covers our first high-end tool that's collecting dust in my shop. Now let's move on to our second tool, which is doing exactly the same. So I told you that I was getting into hand tools and for me, this mostly meant chisels and planes. But I also love power tools. These can be huge time savers as well as a little bit more aggressive. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have the mobility of a hand plane in a power tool? And that's why I purchased this next item. And this is an electric power planer made by Makita. Now there's a lot of different powered hand planes out there, but I chose to go with Makita as I know this is a high quality brand. And I purchased this hand plane from Amazon. Now a little tip, if you're gonna purchase any power tool on Amazon, search for certified refurbished power tool. By putting certified refurbished next to the power tool you're looking for, you can usually find these power tools for 25, maybe even as much as 50% off the normal price. 
So let's talk about why this tool hasn't been getting any use. Well, in my opinion, this is a power tool trying to do a hand tools job. I've got a piece of mahogany chalked up in my vise, so let's see how this thing works. So here I've got this hand plane set to take 1 32nd of an inch off each pass. So I'm gonna take a couple of passes on this and see what it does. So did you see all the material coming off with each one of those passes? This is one of my main concerns. If you don't believe me, let's take a look at my floor. These are all the wood chips taken off with that power planer just with two passes. And the aggressiveness of this tool is the main reason why I hesitate using this tool. It is powerful. When I reach for a plane, I'm looking for gradual, subtle shavings on each pass. And that power planer was set on its second to smallest setting. And since I purchased that machine, I haven't had a need to remove that much material at one time. Let me show you what I think is a better option. So in my shop, I have two hand planes that I usually use. I have a Bench Dogs block plane as well as a Stanley Sweetheart number four. Now these planes give you the feel and allow you to remove just a tad with each pass. So here I'll take my Stanley number four, I'll make two passes and you'll see the difference in the shavings. And that's the difference between a hand plane and a power plane. A hand plane gives you a lot more control as you're running the plane across the wood. And for me, I typically don't break out a plane until I'm towards the end of my project. I mostly use a plane for small cleanup. Now I'm sure those power planers have some excellent uses, but in my shop, this thing is just collecting dust. Now that we've taken a look at two items, now let's move on to our third. So we've talked about making some 90 degree cuts either with the MFT or using a rail square. But what if you need to make a cut that's not at a 90 degree angle? Well, you could use a miter saw, but sometimes you run into some wood that's just a little bit too thick for the miter saw. And this is about the time when you need to start thinking about using a miter gauge over at the table saw. But the problem is most people complain about the miter gauges that come with their table saw. And I was one of those complainers. So I started to Google deep and find some aftermarket miter gauges that I thought would better suit my needs. And I finally found one, one made by Craig, which is a company that I know has quality tools. So I shelled out the 160 bucks that this miter gauge costs and a couple of weeks later, it showed up at my house. Once I received it, I took about two hours to assemble it as I wanted to make sure everything was accurately assembled. And I used this item for about three weeks before I started to see some of the disadvantages of having this miter gauge on my table saw. So first and foremost, this thing is rather large. That's what she said. <laughs> the problem is it is only supported at about 10 inches from the edge of your blade. This means that you can only have supported cross cuts at about 10 inches wide. Once you go beyond that 10 inches, it's completely unsupported and becomes inaccurate and difficult to use. Another problem with this miter gauge is this little pin. I lost my first pin and had to replace it with a new one. This is the pin that locks in the angles. One thing that I do like about this miter gauge is the stop block. This makes repetitive cuts easy. One thing that I don't like about the miter gauge is the play in it. If you look at this here, there's a lot of play in each angle. Lastly, since I do mostly rips at the table saw, the miter gauge is something that I add and remove from the table saw quite frequently. And since this has an awkward shape and size, this thing is not the easiest to install and uninstall. So what has happened? Well, I've reverted back to the miter gauge that came with my table saw. Let me show you why. Well, first off, I like the small size and simple design of the store-bought miter gauge. Secondly, if we pull back on the miter gauge, you can see the Craig miter gauge falls off the end of the table while the saw stop miter gauge stays into place and becomes fully secured whether you have it on the table or off the table. Lastly, the table saw's miter gauge has onboard storage so you can easily put it away when you're not using it and grab it when you need it. I can also transform this miter gauge to something similar to the Craig miter gauge by adding something like plywood or MDF and sending a couple screws through the miter gauge. It's for these reasons that I've reverted back to the original miter gauge and not looked back since then. Now I have heard good things about the Inker miter gauge, so this is one that I may look into down the road. If you are in the market for a miter gauge, I would check out the Wood Whisperers video where he compares a variety of different types of brands, including that Craig one. 
Well that covers our first three high-end items that are collecting dust in my shop. Before we move on to our fourth, I ask you to do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button, leave a like and leave a comment. It really does help out this small woodworking channel. I typically do about two long form videos and one short a week. So hit that notification bell if you're interested in seeing more videos like this. I'll also be leaving links in the description below to all the tools we're taking a look at today. So you can go check out those tools for yourself. Now let's move on to our fourth item. So one of my favorite profiles that I like to put on any furniture leg is a taper. And that's why I purchased this next item. So you may have seen this jig on other YouTube channels as this jig is quite popular. This is the Rockler tapering jig. And this is a high quality tapering jig that allows you to put tapers on things like chair legs. And this jig is used by placing the piece of wood that you want to taper into the jig. Then you simply clamp it down with the two clamps and then you run it through your table saw creating that taper. Now I really think this is a great jig if you're putting modest tapers into your workpiece. However, if you want to go with some more aggressive tapers, this jig won't do it. You see, if you extend the jig to its max capacity, you're really only looking at a taper that goes to about 8.7%. But what if you have a more aggressive taper that you wanna cut into your workpiece? Well, this jig just won't do it. Let's take a look at a jig that will. So this is the system that I've been really impressed with. This is the system that allows you to make an infinite number of jigs just with a couple of items. So this system is the match fit system made by Microjig. And you make these jigs simply with a dovetail bit as well as a couple of clamps. Let's take a closer look. So I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on how to make this tapering jig as I have a video that explains this entire procedure. But essentially you take your dovetail bit and you create slots that you can slide your clamps into. By having all these pre-routed slots, it allows you to take your clamps and set up your workpiece and basically accommodate any angle that you're looking for. By locking down the clamps, you can slide this through your table saw. And really the possibilities are endless with this jig. You can make this jig as large as you want to accommodate any workpiece that you want or any angle you want. With this unique clamping system, you could do angles like 45 degrees, three degrees, or even 90 degrees. So although that Rockler system is quite nice for putting those subtle tapers on things like furniture legs, you really can't beat the versatility and the flexibility of that match fit system. And that's why I find myself reaching for that match fit system no matter what the tapering angle is, more often than using the Rockler system. So since we've taken a look at four dusty items in my shop, let's take a look at one more. So you may or may not have noticed that I've got a lot of sheets of plywood in my shop right now. And that's because I'm making these trees for my kids' school. They're gonna put these trees on their walls and they're gonna create leaves for them. So I'm gonna be making a video on how to make these trees and this may or may not interest you. If anything, I would check out this video just to see the shaper origin in action. But while making these videos, I recently rediscovered a dusty tool in my shop. Let's go take a look at it. So I can honestly say, I'm not sure I've ever actively used this tool in a project. You see, I got these tools when they were on sale as I thought every woodworker must have a set of these. I thought this tool might be perfect for rounding off rough edges on projects that I might be doing in the future. So what is this tool? Well, it's a set of Rockler rasps. Let's go take a closer look at these rasps. So just like with a lot of Rockler tools, these rasps come in a nice container. Now there's three different types of rasp here. There's a round rasp, a curved rasp, as well as a flat rasp. Now each of these three different types of rasp have a rough cut rasp as well as a fine cut rasp. To give you an idea of what these rasps do to wood, let's get a rough cut piece of mahogany and use a fine cut and rough cut rasp to see how it affects the wood. To give you an idea of the effects of a rasp, I'm gonna take 15 strokes with a fine cut rasp and 15 strokes with a rough cut rasp. Then we're gonna take a closer look at the difference between the two. So let's take a closer look at the aggressive nature of these rasp. If we look at both the fine tooth as well as the rough tooth, you can see they're quite aggressive and removed quite a bit of material. So this is where my own ignorance came into play with the rasp. The rasp is more of a shaping and carving tool than it is a finishing tool. So if you do carvings or aggressive shaping on projects, this could be an excellent tool for you. However, in my woodworking journey, I haven't found a need for it yet. Instead, I'm looking for a more subtle shaping tool, something that can smooth out a curved area without removing a whole lot of material. You see, if I were to use a rasp where these tree branches split, it would absolutely rip apart this material. 
So that's why I find myself using this next tool to smooth out those rounded edges. So this is a sanding block with some contoured profiles, and this is what I find myself using more often than anything else. Now I prefer the Milescraft sand plane as it comes with a couple of different contours that seem to fit my sanding needs. Now there's a bunch of different sanding blocks out there, all with different contours, so find one that works for you and your budget. And it's sanding blocks like this that allow you to get into tight spots without removing a whole lot of material. So think twice before you purchase a rasp and think about whether or not you need such an aggressive shaping tool. Well, that's five tools that are collecting dust in my shop. Now, I don't want anybody to think any of the tools that are collecting dust in my shop might collect dust in your shop. Every single one of these tools that's collecting dust in my shop is a quality tool and probably serves a purpose in somebody else's shop. I just haven't found a regular need for it in mine. Well, thanks for walking through these 10 tools in my shop today. I really appreciate you watching this video. And if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button, leave a like and leave a comment. Until next time, take care as always.